Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Cremondo for Yoga You Online, and I'm here today with Doug Keller. For those one or two of you who are not familiar with Doug's stellar body of work, he's a yoga teacher and therapist. His background reflects a lifelong commitment to studying and sharing his vast knowledge, not just of yoga poses, but yoga anatomy, yoga philosophy, history. I'm sure I'm missing something, Doug. Uh, with a graduate degree in philosophy from both Georgetown and Fordham universities, Doug's taught college level philosophy for several years, uh, but I think he pursued his deepest education at the Siddha Meditation Center Ashram, Guryadev Siddha. Siddha Peace, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that, <laughs> I'm not good at that. Uh, for seven years, and then he, spent 14 years traveling, doing service, practicing, just proliferating this teaching around the world at uh, other ashrams. In addition to his teaching in the various venues worldwide, including here for us at Yoga U, which we're always happy about, Doug was a regular columnist for Yoga Plus Magazine, formerly Yoga International's magazine. He was also a distinguished professor for three years in the yoga therapy master's degree program at Maryland University of Integrative Health. He's authored three highly respected books on asana, pranayama, and yoga philosophy. His latest work, Yoga as Therapy, offers an in-depth look at how we can use all of the aspects of yoga practice in a therapeutic uh, sense for everybody. So Doug, it's always an honor and also a little bit like a, taking a college course to have a conversation with you. But I do want to talk to you about something that I know you've been taking a deep dive into and that has something to do with the whole COVID pandemic. While some of us are returning to some semblance of life before COVID and kind of leaving in the rear view mirror some of the worst of what's gone on, um, there are new variants that are still coming out. It's not over yet. The good news is that the pharmaceuticals are better. They're responding quickly to the variants. The symptoms and the symptom set seems to be less severe. People seem to be able to recover more quickly. And that's kind of the good news, but there are lingering issues for some of us that seem to be hanging around and, and will be in the foreseeable future. And that's what I kind of want to talk to you about because I've read this alarming statistic that as many as a third of COVID-19 survivors, most of whom didn't need hospitalization, they weren't even that sick, are still facing a host of symptoms that persist for months and months. And sometimes those symptoms are quite different from the symptoms of COVID that we're familiar with, the respiratory issues or even the fever and all of that. They're, they're having cardiovascular effects. They're having cognition issues, dizziness, heart palpitations, fatigue, lots of things that don't seem to be related to COVID and yet, they're hanging on and they don't seem to have a cure. Can you speak just first to that? Let's kind of break this down. Yeah, I think that's why it's interesting to have this discussion about what we're calling dysautonomia. Um, because first of all, you've done a nice job of distinguishing uh, or making the kind of distinguish, uh, distinction that I'd like to point up in this discussion uh, that COVID and its ramifications are one thing. Like you're saying, we're doing a better and better job of handling the ramifications that come directly from the disease. Uh, and at the same time, the symptoms that people are experiencing, particularly in the form of long COVID, are distinct from that. And a lot of the people, a significant number of the people suffering from long COVID symptoms, uh, which is... Uh, grab bag of a number of different symptoms we're talking about are actually people who are asymptomatic who either 
did not even manifest the disease or was very, very minor. I was even reading a study about a study in Scotland of people with long COVID symptoms. And part of the control group was people who uh, supposedly never tested positive for COVID or never, in other words, never had COVID. And given uh, comparing the uh, test, the failure rate of the test or the inaccuracy of the COVID test to the number of people claiming long COVID symptoms without ever having had COVID, uh, there's even some reason to believe those people actually had COVID but didn't realize it and it did not show up in the test. Uh, and so the point is largely the severity of long COVID symptoms is not necessarily related to the severity of actually having had COVID. Though there is some, there is some evidence that having the vaccine does reduce or contribute to reducing the symptoms of long COVID while not necessarily entirely eliminating the possibility. The distinction I wanna make is that the symptoms that we're causing, calling long COVID are being brought to our attention by people who have gone through COVID, even asymptomatic people, and then started to manifest it afterwards. But these sorts of clusters of symptoms that are being discussed existed before COVID and were not foremost in our consciousness and uh, doctors didn't quite know what to do with it. The, the topic of the webinar is what we're calling dysautonomia, which means a dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is that aspect of our nurse, nervous system that takes care of the automatic functions of the body that we don't have to think about. Respiration, heartbeat, blood pressure, uh, regulation of the digestive system, also dealing with things like um, what's called orthostatic tolerance or intolerance. In other words, if, you stay, if you've been sitting for a while and then stand up and suddenly mm -hmm. feel dizzy because of the change in blood pressure, your body usually regulates that so you don't feel dizzy. But when that's not happening properly, you get dizzy and then you have to sit down again. I've even experienced that myself sometimes when I've had to teach a class when I have a little bit of a cold or a fever over the last couple of years, that's been like online too. Uh, but sometimes demonstrating a pose like a forward bend, teaching the class, and then I stand up from that, I get a little bit dizzy for a minute because I'm sick. It's a sign that that regulation of blood pressure was a little bit off. After I got well, that went away and it was not a problem. But in any case, the point is, this was happening to people before COVID ever arrived upon the scene. And so the symptoms that people are manifesting or calling long COVID are not necessarily directly caused by COVID, though there can be something about COVID that attacks the autonomic nervous system and sets off this problem of dysautonomia. But again, it's not limited to COVID or it's not that COVID is the cause of dysautonomia. We're just aware of it because of COVID. And so this is a larger question that's related to problems like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, many different forms of inflammatory conditions, different forms of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, these other things. They're all linked to, in general, uh, the, the highest risk cases of people with COVID, what they had in common was often uh, inflammatory problems, also including things like diabetes, where essentially the nervous system is not properly regulating the sympathetic parasympathetic balance of the nervous system. When we're under stress, like having a cold or fighting a virus, or emotional stress, or not getting enough rest, we go into a sympathetic response, which is sort of the body's uh, defensive response to these things. And once the challenge has been met, the body is supposed to shift back into the parasympathetic, normal functioning rest and digest response, which is actually controlled by the aspect of the autonomic nervous system that involves the vagus nerve. With these inflammatory conditions and the persistence of these symptoms, 
it's largely because we're not able to shift back into a parasympathetic state. Something is wrong with the system that's supposed to do that. And so that can create a, a sort of vicious cycle of symptoms that either get worse or persist over time or become chronic in some way. So the real problem is with the nervous system itself not being adaptable enough. Uh, and a lot of people are talking about the vagus nerve these days, and the vagus nerve does play a principal role in this. I think of it in terms of the adaptability of the vagus nerve, its ability to respond and restore us to a parasympathetic state, getting us out of a sympathetic state. That's what's going wrong there. Uh, and that could be more at fault than COVID itself. And so what I want to look at in this webinar is both going a little bit deeper into understanding this problem of dysautonomia, how it manifests, uh, some understanding of how doctors look at it and what their treatment is, but it's also primarily looking at uh, simple accessible yoga practices that are kind of like the foundation of yoga practice that people can do to help support this restoration of the adaptability of the autonomic nervous system, the ability of the parasympathetic system to reestablish itself. And this extends to not only simple asanas to do, but breath practices. And I'm also starting to realize some of the um, practices that are sort of classical hatha yoga that we don't often do because they seem a little bit weird, like the simasana, the lion pose where you stick your tongue out and open mm -hmm. your mouth really wide and breathe really hard, uh, actually has an effect upon the vagus nerve because we'll look at how tension around the jaw and the neck can actually interrupt the function of the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic nervous system. So, so, so part of the uh, problem that leads to this dysfunction for people can be postural problems or jaw tension problems or neck tension problems. And yoga practices address that as well. But overall, the point here is it, it's important to look at the larger problem of dysautonomia uh, because it encompasses some of the more mysterious aspects of what we're calling long COVID, but it also extends to conditions that people once again have been experiencing before COVID that have not been effectively understood or addressed. If anything, one of the upsides of the whole COVID pand pandemic has been that it's brought this to the fore of attention because it is affecting a large number of people. There are as many as a million people that cannot work, cannot work right now because of long COVID and another 4 million, this is from a recent article in the Washington Post, another 4, four million who are having difficulty returning to work uh, because of these symptoms. And so they need supportive practices to help them on that road to recovery. And I have a number of friends that are similarly suffering from long COVID and looking for ways to restore themselves. And they have found the yoga practices have been helpful in that. So if I'm getting this correctly, and I will just remind anyone listening that a conversation with you is to take a college course. So I'm going to unpack a few of the things you said just for yeah. those of us uh, who, who aren't up to speed. Um, this is autonomic nervous stuff, which is attacking our sense of homeostasis, which is really important to us, that resilience of, of bouncing back. But what yeah. you're saying, if I'm hearing this correctly, is that someone who's who's got long COVID, A, didn't necessarily know they even had one of these COVID variations. They might have been asymptomatic. Yeah. And B, they had a vulnerability in their system already that via the long COVID process is bringing out this uh, yeah. kind of cluster of symptoms that maybe are then coming out of the blue for them. So they don't even know they had COVID, which is probably yeah. what, what I've read is that it's taking a really long time, for example, for someone to get a diagnosis and that it took a long time for people to connect even those dots that these were connected. Yeah. Is that I was, right about that? Yeah, one of my sources is a book on a dysautonomia from a, a whole consortium of doctors called the Dysautonomia Project. It was written prior 
to COVID, though updated with COVID. And they actually said on the average, it takes about six years to get a proper diagnosis of dysautonomia because the symptoms resemble other things so much that it takes a while for doctors to drill it down to that problem. And, and it's partly in medical education, the problem of dysautonomia is mentioned during medical school, but not really emphasized or explored enough for that to be foremost in a doctor's consciousness when they're trying to make uh, a diagnosis. And it's mysterious, like you're saying, there's a variety of uh, symptoms and with the symptoms that come up, they tend to show up in clusters where people can have uh, problems like brain fog, inability to concentrate related, uh, I wanna call them cognitive issues or mental issues, but in the sense of brain fog and difficulty focusing, or they could have a cluster of symptoms around the heart like palpitations, irregular mm -hmm. heartbeat, or it could center around digestion or breathing. And one of the things that this suggests is that the hormones in the body that are in charge of regulating these different systems, such as digestion or heart rate or breath or brain function, um, for that particular person, the problem of dysautonomia is there's not a proper regulation of that system through the hormones that are stimulated to be produced through the autonomic nervous system. So it's not like everything goes haywire at once. It's like if you had a big circuit breaker board, one of the circuit breakers is off while the other ones are functioning and the doctors have to figure out which one of the circuit breakers isn't working properly. And so an approach in the medical community is to address that system of the body, which is not producing the regulatory hormones properly and try to address it that way. And it takes them a long time to really drill down and figure out which hormones are missing or which hormones are not regulating that particular system. So even once they get the clue that the problem is dysautonomia, not something else, though there could be something else coincidental to that, which further confuses things, then they have to go through a series of tests to try to figure out exactly what's going wrong. But the overall problem is, um, a person in one respect or another tends to be stuck more in sympathetic inflammatory states and has a harder time restoring parasympathetic states. And that can be from a number of factors, emotional stress, lack of rest. And keep in mind, I mean, obviously during the last few years of COVID, it's not just COVID, but it was the stress, the emotional stress that people were yeah. under. Um, and the uncertainty. That, yeah, exactly. So you can have somebody who doesn't have very severe COVID or has is asymptomatic, but still manifests these long COVID symptoms. Again, not so much because of the disease, but because of what's been happening in the nervous system out mm -hmm. of the stress of the couple of years that we lived through. Uh, and so, like you're saying, these things that were kind of under the surface percolating are brought to the surface by the whole situation in which we found ourselves, And a lot of it gets blamed upon the virus itself, but it's really the ramifications of the virus that affect us in that way. And so what we have to look to is, um, you know, everybody is looking to the immune system and saying, well, I have a healthy immune system, so on and so forth. Well, the proper functioning of your immune system depends upon how well you take care of yourself in the larger perspective of, in terms of rest, emotional health, so on and so forth. And again, the practices of Hatha Yoga were meant to address that larger penumbra of self-care techniques that support the immune system. And I find it interesting that classical Hatha Yoga puts so much emphasis upon uh, taking care of the digestive system. Uh, for me, it was always kind of obvious reasons when you're looking at 15th century India, uh, problems like food poisoning, digestion in that climate, all of that I'm sure were concerns. And so they took care of their digestive health in that way. But in studying this, it came to my attention more that most of the hormones produced in the body that regulate the function of the body are produced in, in the trunk, in the gut, in the digestive area. And so if we don't take care of that area of the body, which is addressed in yoga through forward bending, twisting, to some extent, back bending, and so on and so forth, if we don't care, take care of the health of that area of the body, 
it affects the hormone production, which in turn affects our the strength of our immune system, the appropriate response of our immune system, as well as the function of the organs of the body. Uh, so again, it's a much larger question than COVID itself. Interesting as well, because what you're describing also sounds to me like a few other things. For example, uh, before there was a test for psoriatic arthritis, people would spend many, many years testing for all the other forms of arthritis and ruling them out. Or fibromyalgia. People went, I yeah. worked with clients who, who went for years until their symptom it was fibromyalgia. I think there may be a blood test for that one now. I, I haven't kept up yeah. as well, but what you're saying is an autonomic nervous system dysfunction, regardless of the cause, will have or could have some of these uh, a huge this role cluster in it. of yeah. symptoms. And as yogis, yeah. do we need to know what it is or do we just go with what are the practices that regulate that's a good or, point or, because I mean, doctors are looking. Yeah, doctors are looking for a very, very specific diagnosis, which of course, yogis, we don't have the equipment or the know-how to make that kind of specific diagnosis. So we're not therapists or doctors in that sense. But in a broader sense, um, all of these are related to inflammatory conditions of the body, which are really driven by or being stuck in sympathetic states of the nervous system. Now, in this discussion, just to make some things simple, instead of always talking about sympathetic, parasympathetic, mm -hmm. technical college language like that, I find that the language of yoga, like the gunas, sattva, rajas, yes. and tamas, yes. uh, give a much more experiential sense of the same point, like homeostasis, a state of normal functioning of the body in which the heart rate is appropriate, digestion functions well, breath is diaphragmatic. That state of homeostasis is the state regulated by a parasympathetic nervous system, by the vagus nerve, uh, and you could call it a sattvic state, the mm -hmm. basic state of functioning of sattva, whereas a stimulated uh, sympathetic state of the nervous system would could be termed rajasic. And I actually want to make the point that we usually speak of the sympathetic state as being fight or flight, as if we're always posed by, threatened by some kind of danger or something that puts us into, a, again, a fight or flight response. It's not just that. It's being interested in and engaged in the world, being curious, being motivated, even being a little bit competitive. We enjoy being competitive from mm -hmm. time to time because it brings us into a sympathetic state of a kind of excitement, which is fun and it feels good. So it's not always associated with trauma. Uh, but again, as much as we get you know, interested, engaged and competitive, that also has to be balanced by returning to a restful state of homeostasis. Mm -hmm. So we're always striking this fine balance between sattva and rajas, uh, actually teetering between the two. So it's never, I'm either sattvic or rajasic, I'm finding the striking the right balance between the two by which I'm engaged in the world outside, but at the same time centered within myself. Being centered within myself is sattva, being engaged, uh, participating in the world as rajas, which also leads to tamas, uh, a state of inertia, which is both the quality that helps us to go to sleep at night and be at rest, but also tamas can be uh, more often a sort of extreme reaction to stress or trauma by which people disassociate or withdraw or don't engage with other people. I'm not talking about introversion here. I'm talking more about a sort of shutdown state. There's been a lot of discussion in Yogi and everywhere else about the polyvagal theory, uh, which I'm interested in too. And I think there's a lot to it. At the same time, uh, the mechanics of that theory is controversial. So as much as people talk about the polyvagal theory, there are other people that come up and say, well, that theory has been either hasn't been proven. Some people say it's been debunked. Some people say it's not specific enough to be tested. There's a lot of controversy about how accurate that theory is in describing the mechanics of it. I don't think we really have to get into that 
the mechanics that can be sorted out by the scientists, we do recognize the tamasic state by which people get withdrawn or uh, go into depressive states, uh, which is actually signified by a severe drop in adrenaline. As much as a, a rajasic state or a sympathetic state is marked by an increase in adrenaline, that's what gets us excited. Uh, a tamasic state is a severe drop in adrenaline that makes the person feel drained and listless and disassociated. And adrenaline is one of the main uh, hormones that strike the balance between sattva and rajas. And when it goes haywire, it creates a state of exhaustion or withdrawal, like I said. So in any case, the language of the gunas, sattva, rajas, tamas speaks in an experiential way to the different kinds of problems that we're encountering here. And to get back to your point, most of those problems of the different forms of itis arthritis, all these inflammatory conditions, they tend to be related to being stuck in a rajasic state. Mm -hmm. And of course, in our culture, I think we can be stuck in a rajasic state for a long period of time and not even know it. It's, yeah. it's a little bit heightened state of stimulation in which we might feel motivated, but we're actually exhausting ourselves because we can't restore rest and renew in this sort of a sattvic state. And then what we get is a kind of blowback that throws us into a tamasic state. So again, you don't have to have a specific diagnosis. We just have to recognize the problem and work. What with. is interesting about what you just said? Everything is interesting about what you just said. But um, one of my takeaways is this, because a lot of times people say fight or flight like it's a bad thing always, or rest and restore like it's a good thing Rajas is too much, Rajas is bad, too much Thomas. But if you have too much Rajasic energy and you want to get to Sattva, where are you going to get that? Tamasic energy. That what you're talking about is that little dance, that they're both important. There's not a good, there's not a bad. But the homeostasis that we're looking for is us kind of dancing between them and finding the center, which is homeostasis or Sattva. Right. Yeah. And yeah. we can do that, as you've pointed out, without having a degree in medicine by simply working with our yoga tools to bring about a better balance of all of these energies. Not this is a good one. This is a bad one. But just like cooking, if yeah. you have too much rajas in there, you want to add a little tamas. Right to get to sattva, which is delicious. Um, yeah, tamas right. in the state of, in the sense of rest. So like the good, like you're saying, the good thing about tamas is it helps you get, get a deep sleep at night. When you can't stay awake, you go to sleep, sleep soundly. That's tamas as a quality of nature. Uh, and at the same time, if you're overly stressed and not resting enough, then you crash and that's tamas and not so great a sense because you feel depleted of energy. It's kind of like your body's shutting you down for you. And that's just a sign that you need more good rest and also uh, a balance between more sattvic activity, which is calming and centering to balance out the rajasic activity that you're otherwise kind of stuck with. And one thing I've started to come to understand better as a measure of the adaptability of the vagus nerve and the autonomic nervous system is what they call heart rate variability, which means from beat to beat, your heartbeat is actually not, a, not absolutely regular. If you measure from beat to beat, it can be a fraction of a, sec a second sooner or later, um, often so subtle that we don't really feel it for ourselves. That's actually a sign of health and adaptability because heart rate slightly increases by sympathetic stimulation and decreases by a parasympathetic response. And so in a given moment, if you're stimulated sympathetically, there is some stimulus coming in through the senses uh, or you're engaged in talking to somebody, the heartbeat might go up a little bit, but at the same time, as you stay centered within yourself, it slows down. If we do something very active, like play a game or play a sport or go exercise or go for a brisk walk or a jog, your heart rate variability becomes less because your heart rate is increased by what you're doing. And the adaptability of the uh, 
autonomic nervous system is your ability to go from a heightened sympathetic state, such as when you're exercising, back to that restorative uh, sattvic state. And yoga practice, even in, in vinyasa, supports that as we go back and forth between more active use of the body in asana, but also moments of, of pose and repose of resting within the practice. And it's actually the variability of an asana practice, which is very supportive in one respect of the autonomic nervous system. And the breath practices do much the same thing. And we'll be talking about that in the course. These elements that you can emphasize in your practice that support healthy adaptability of the autonomic nervous system. So you have referenced the course a few times. You are going to be teaching a course for us. You're gonna really unpack dysautonomia as well as the relationship to COVID, but the fact is that it's much more prevalent. And yeah, it's really more than just COVID. Yeah, it's more is, than just COVID. Yeah, yeah, autonomic system, yeah, dysregulation. However, because of long haul COVID, many more people are experiencing these symptoms and don't have any idea why. Yeah. So the course you're gonna be teaching is really about nervous system regulation, uh, restoring balance and yogic tools to calm an overactive nervous system. So whether we know that we've had COVID or not, or we know uh, that we have a diagnosis, but we have a dysregulated autonomic nervous system, which I think one of the main points that you're making is many, many, people have that now post COVID don't necessarily know why, but you're going to be teaching yeah. a course on yoga tools yeah. to handle this. So can you I think it is going to, it is going to be a, a health challenge going into the future. And it's like, as you were saying at the beginning, we're doing better with the virus COVID itself, but we need to start to look at the aftermath of that and how we address that health challenge uh, in general for people, which is gonna, again, include more people than just those who have been affected by COVID. But at the same time, we want it to be helpful to people suffering from these symptoms. And it has to be addressed gradually in a way that people can handle. Because one of the problems is if you overdo and your approach, if you if you exercise too strongly or overdo anything, you risk just having a blowback and feeling worse for having done it, which is another uh, indicator that the autonomic nervous system is not adapting to what you were doing. And I do find previous to COVID, it's like people who got into yoga and other things tended to push a little bit hard and overdo. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing has set us back on our heels where we have to take another look and really decide for ourselves in terms of exercise and everything else, how much is the right amount that supports us because overdoing or pushing too much is counterproductive. So we're kind of reevaluating our understanding of how we how we take care of our health and the old, you know, just do it approach of Nike just doesn't quite mm -hmm. work as well yeah. anymore. So there is a real nuanced approach that we need to take to balancing energy, but that really lends itself so much to the tools of yoga, because if we kind of exploit, not in that way, but exploit the whole range of tools we have, is that what you'll be talking about in the yeah. class? Not yes, just, yeah. you know, kick ass vinyasa and that's the solution for everything yeah i but find it funny in the hatha yoga pradipika the 15th century text the first one that put out uh organized yoga practice or hatha yoga practice it lists the obstacles to yoga or what things take away from your yoga or hurt your yoga and one of the obstacles to yoga is practicing yoga too much or practicing too hard or overdoing. Mm -hmm. It was recognized right from the start that overdoing was as uh, harmful to your yoga as not doing it at all. So it is really mm -hmm. a, a matter of finding the right balance. Well, I'm excited because I think this, this first of all, this concept of dysautonomia, I think it sounds like something that as we're going forward and we're learning more more and more things are going to fit in that umbrella that uh, yeah. are just going to be about, we just need to 
be more gentle and intuitive and nuanced and balanced in how we treat ourselves and if we're teachers, our students. And it sounds like that's where you're going in this course to yes. really talk about right effort and right approach. Yeah, it'll be a, hopefully a balanced approach to taking good care of yourself and looking to all the factors that support good self-care. And yoga is an essential, uh, helpful, if not essential part of it, but not the only thing in that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The yoga gives you a larger context. Excellent. Well, Doug, thank you so much for, I feel that I've been schooled. <laughs> so, <laughs> so interesting. I'm excited about the course and uh, we'll see you there. Thank you again. I look so forward to it. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.